Hello everyone, this is Ty Everett of the Hack Street Boys and today we're going to be showing our hackathon submission for the Escript 2024 uh, hackathon. What I'd like to present for you today is something I've been thinking about for a little while and this hackathon created the perfect opportunity for me to build this. So what I've built is a Bitcoin CPU. Uh, this CPU allows general purpose computation on top of Bitcoin and allows you to compile from a custom assembly language that I wrote down into uh, the CPU's actual opcodes. I've implemented an entire CPU architecture on top of Bitcoin within the context of an Escript contract. I've integrated Babbage for actually creating the uh, transactions and I'd love to uh, show it to you now. I'm going to start by going through the readme file here and then we'll actually uh, pull it up and we can have a look. So, right, the Bitcoin CPU um, allows you to execute code using what I'm calling the Everett CPU architecture on Bitcoin. Um, so the CPU is coded, of course, in Escript. It's got a heap, it's got a stack, and four registers. Code will begin executing at the beginning of the heap and when you start the contract, uh, you kind of define what you want to be on the heap at the beginning. Um, there's an execution pointer, a stack pointer, and a base pointer. The execution pointer is incremented after each instruction, and each instruction creates a new Bitcoin transaction, which increments the state of the CPU uh, forward, and it um, is analogous to a CPU clock cycle. So it is one transaction per CPU clock cycle. Uh, this allows us to do some really interesting things, like implement jumps. So um, let's go ahead and unpack a few things though, right? Programs executed by the CPU require various opcodes. Uh, you can use opprint just for output, and you can decide what that means within the context of the environment where you're using the CPU. And I've also added opread for reading input uh, into the, uh, the CPU from whoever is executing the uh, program that is being run. That way your program can like prompt users for things, it can uh, ask them to enter information, it can verify that information programmatically, and then we've got some cool new opcodes as well to talk about, um, such as uh, things that govern the contract. So for example, opwin, if you get to that opcode, will release all the funds in the UTXO and allow the CPU to be kind of disassembled, uh, while opbill which uh, will, will basically uh, require the person who is executing the program to uh, provide additional funds into the CPU's uh, UTXO in order to actually uh, proceed. The CPU, uh, if it ever reaches off lose, then um, there will be no way to continue execution analogous to a CPU uh, halt on top of uh, Bitcoin. Now, uh, what would that mean though, right? If someone tries to solve your uh, program, right? Suppose I, I, I initialize this CPU smart contract with a heap and an empty stack, and I, um, you know, I, I start the execution pointer at, at execution pointer zero, and, and then kind of you know, start executing this, this code. Um, well, how can I prevent somebody from uh, maliciously uh, just kind of executing the first few clock cycles, entering in some bogus information into the program, and then just maybe they don't get anything out of it, but they would um, they would mess up the program for everyone else, right? They they kind of took this UTXO, they spent it forward in these ways, and they never actually got us to a place where it was doing anything useful. Well, I solved that problem thankfully, and it was a very um, you know great thing when we when we solved this. Um, so working together with my colleague Braden, we came up with a solution. If you want to start solving the contract, it is locked at the beginning, you have to put up a bounty. Putting up the bounty will uh, allow you the ability to, you know, make additional transactions with this UTXO, spending it forward, for a set period of time. And if during that time you either achieve a checkpoint, which is an opcode called op checkpoint, or if you achieve op win, you know, the whole thing gets unlocked and you get your bounty back, plus the reward, uh, but if you lose, meaning you don't successfully uh, complete the uh, chain of execution that you claim to have you know, achieved uh, by the time that uh, you know, the, the, the clock runs out on the bounty that you've put in, 
then that bounty essentially is lost. And anybody can call a public method on the contract at that point and reset its state back to the initial. And what that means is that now it's reset and anybody else can come along when they actually have the solution, except now you lost your money, number one, and number two, um, the bounty for other people to come up with the real solution to the uh, problem is actually uh, significantly increased because it's a bounty multiplier. It gets more and more every time. And so, you know, it shouldn't matter to you if you know that off-chain you've executed things. And I'm going to get into my off-chain uh, kind of emulator that runs this CPU. I wrote the script contract as well. I'll show all of that code uh, in just a second. But I want to cover some of the uh, high-level concepts first, right? So, yeah, I shouldn't know. It shouldn't be a problem, right? Like, I can run this off-chain. I can get to my solution trying different combinations of transactions and and uh, and, and different, you know, branch, uh, you know, branch statements in the code, uh, running different code paths. Uh, it also supports conditional jumping and subroutines and all of that stuff. So I implemented that into my CPU architecture. Um, but yeah, that's essentially the uh, the high level is is you 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 know that you've got the solution off chain before you make any transactions on chain. So you know if you're going to make say a thousand dollars by solving an on chain bounty, uh, you know by solving one of these uh, these CPUs that is put on chain these 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 programs that are defined on chain using this CPU uh, kind of architecture. Um, then you know you shouldn't have a problem putting up five hundred dollar bounty, actually executing it, and then successfully claiming your thousand dollars and cleaning up the whole thing, and then you're done. But if you're malicious, you know you'd lose that five hundred dollars because um, you know you 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 weren't able to successfully go down the path of transactions that you uh, you ended up trying to send. So that's basically what all this stuff here says in the stopping malicious partial solutions in multi-stage contract transaction chains. Um, you know, we have this, uh, this basically, you know, right up here that describes kind of that in a little bit more detail. Um, so writing smart contracts with the Everett CPU. Uh, let's go through this. So smart contracts can be described by initializing the CPU with a heap memory that contains a program uh, defining the constraints of the contract. Um, so at initialization, the original heap is always uh, recorded so that it can be reset in case of a malicious partial solution. So also the, the execution pointer, the stack pointer, the base pointer, and the, the, the stack itself are, are preserved in their initial state so they can be brought back to that state in case someone does maliciously try to disrupt when, when they you know, broadcast a partial solution. But um, the architecture supports many operations from basic arithmetic and logic to subroutines and conditional jumps. Stack operations and register move operations are also supported uh, due to the unique nature of the emulated environment. Uh, there are some interesting characteristics as well um, and observations about the machine. So um, there is no limit on the stack or heap memory. Uh, the program is free to allocate memory at any location and jump to it. On chain, these are represented with Script uh, hashed map types, which um, utilize uh, Merkle trees and off-chain values, meaning that uh, you know you can even keep things confidential. And I'll get to that in a second. Um, due to this use of Merkle trees, certain regions of memory can be kept confidential with um, you know, uh, until they're actually needed within currently executing code. Uh, so the needed values could be um, revealed to potential solvers off-chain on a need-to-know basis uh, once they've proven they've gotten a certain way towards the solution. There is no requirement that memory elements or registers use only a single byte of data, as demonstrated by opcodes like oppay, where an entire output script is read from a CPU register and enforced in the spending transaction, the use of big integer types means that there is no fundamental limit to the size of memory elements in the computer. So no longer do you have to have one byte per you know, element of memory in this uh, computer. You can move around e extremely large uh, values. I've, I've messed with up to like uh, 500 uh, kilobytes in one memory element. Uh, computing some very large numbers, as I'll get to with some of my example assembly code. So uh, in order to run the CPU debugger, you just clone this repository, and then you install dependencies and start the environment. So you know you, you will clone it, 
and we'll go ahead and just npm i here in my terminal now that I have it pulled down. And, um, you know, there's some npm things, but then I can say npm run dev, and I'll go ahead and press O, and that's going to open my uh, web browser. I'm also going to launch my uh, MetaNet uh, client. So I'm just going to pull this up here. Yep, you can see my UI. So I've got, there's also a call stack I added just for simplicity. So there's actually two stacks. Um, I, so at the top here, we have the Everett CPU. I'll just kind of zoom up on this a little bit so you can see a little bit better what's going on here. Just pardon me as I do that. Right. And um, right. So the, the UI is um, fairly involved, but I'll get to what all of this is. On the left hand side, we have the heap. And then we have our registers, including our execution pointer and our general purpose registers. We have our stack here, and then we have our call stack. So this is all emulated in an S script contract that that at each transaction kind of does one clock cycle of this CPU incrementing the execution pointer forward. And then down here, I wrote a custom assembly language for my assembler code, and I can enter some program in there and assemble it uh, into uh, kind of a bytecode, which I can then move to the heap as I start execution. At the top here, we have a basic control bar, so I can export the current puzzle if I have something exported, or if I have something written in here, I can, I can kind of export it out so that somebody can take that and um, import it and solve it and make money from, from doing so. I can import a puzzle, of course, and once I have some, uh, some code in here, um, I can actually boot the uh, CPU. So if I, if I were to add, you know, I've code 49, for example, we'll just write out a simple program. It lets me boot. So when I boot the CPU, um, it's going to start execution at execution pointer uh, zero. You can see the execution pointer represented here, and it just adds an additional thing there. Uh, I can then increment the CPU, and of course, opcode 49, because go 49ers is the win opcode, so uh, it just says that I win in after one single CPU cycle, because that's what opcode 49 does. After you win, you can then, you know, reset the CPU back to its original state, and because I already won, it'll ask me, you know, why are you doing this, but there it is. Um, that's basically the, uh, the initial, uh, you know, little bit. Um, if I were to have exported the puzzle before I were to have execu executed this code, um, then it would, it would allow me to broadcast my solution after having entered an amount for the, the bounty, and um, I could then actually claim that bounty very, very simply by running one CPU cycle, given that opcode 49 is just win. It'd be a very, very easy, um, you know, bounty to, to claim in this, in this context. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the basic CPU debugger. Uh, now we can actually run some example programs using the CPU, and then I'll get into the smart contract and how that works. So, um, yep, first you have uh, the instructions here for setting up as a, uh, for development. Um, the browser should open. The control panel will be at the top, as I said, with the heap on the left and the stack on the right. Uh, various registers are in the middle. Um, uh, below, you'll be able to see the assembler, uh, where you can assemble code um, and, uh, and such things, right? You can start by writing some assembly code in the bottom left pane of the assembler and assembling it into the machine code, which will appear on the right. Um, you can check out the examples uh, for some, some example assembly programs that you can write and paste in just on the left. You can modify them as you want. Um, and if there is any errors during the assembly process, they will be shown using uh, alert boxes. Uh, you can copy your assembled machine code from the right-hand panel and then um, drop it directly into the heap, making sure to um, uh, preserve new line characters. Uh, that's important because in this, uh, this bytecode representation, new lines are the separator between um, you know, uh, uh, particular uh, operations or, 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 or elements of this, uh, this bytecode. Uh, once you have loaded the heap with your program, select the boot option from the um, controls at the top and the CPU will initialize uh, uh, with the instruction pointer at uh, zero. You will then be able to, uh, or you, you will not be able to edit the heap text until, of course, after the CPU has been booted. Um, and so, uh, you know, you'll be able to increment the execution pointer uh, to step through your program. And then, of course, we'll get to some input and output and some fun things. Um, you know, adding some numbers, playing a number guessing game and all that stuff with this Bitcoin CPU um, in, in just a moment. So uh, you can cycle the CPU forward by clicking the increment button, as I said, 
and the execution pointer will advance. Um, you'll be able to see the value of the heap, the stack, and the registers in the CPU debugger window. Um, if you are running a program that will not result in an infinite loop, you can select the run option from the control panel. The um, program should uh, proceed uh, nearly to completion. You may need to increment the final time in order to get past the win instruction into your transaction broadcast. Um, now, let's think about some implications here, and we'll get to more implications at the end, but right, like, I just mentioned an infinite loop, and it is entirely possible to write a program using this, uh, this system that, that actually does have an infinite loop in it. And, uh, you know, the question is, is someone going to keep creating Bitcoin transactions and incrementing this program infinitely, or are they going to stop? Um, and the answer is that eventually they'll run out of money, so it doesn't make sense to, uh, to execute that code. But it's an economic mechanism to uh, enforce that type of thing versus um, just kind of having hard limits in place like Ethereum does with their, their gas limits. Um, right, so... Um, you should now be able to write and execute programs that work on the CPU. Uh, next, we're going to um, go through the process of publishing programs to the chain for people to solve and solving such puzzles. Um, to follow this section of the tutorial, ensure that you have installed the Babbage Meta client on your computer, on stage line or main line, and that it is currently running on your machine. Uh, first, you should write your puzzle in the assembler and assemble it into machine code. Load the machine code into the heap as normal, uh, making sure to preserve the new line characters as always. Open your browser console. Instead of selecting boot, select export puzzle. And after giving the system time to compose your new contract, the MetaNet client should prompt you for authorization. If, you su if you're successful, an alert will pop up with the TXID. A very large, several megabytes piece of text will appear in your browser console. Copy it and save it to file um, so that you can access and import it later or send it to someone else so that that person could access and import your program later. Your CPU will now be booted with the puzzle action loaded. You may cycle the CPU. Um, you can input and output data as normal. If your program executes off win, then you can select the broadcast option on the top right uh, after it becomes active. Uh, select the broadcast option from the control panel and a series of Bitcoin transactions will be sent. First, uh, uh, you know, posting your solver's bond um, and then claiming your solution, unlocking the value in the contract and bringing it back to your own self. If you, uh, if you didn't want to solve it yourself, you can also... Um, uh, you can, you know, share it uh, for anybody else. Um, you could publish it to an overlay. Um, you could um, take that file that we saved earlier and give it to someone else so that they could attempt to solve it. The steps for importing a solved puzzle uh, from file are as follows. First, you're going to start the CPU debugger and use the import file uh, option, import puzzle option rather. Uh, go ahead and paste the large puzzle data payload uh, when prompted from the file that you, you saved or received. And after a short delay, the CPU should now be booted and ready for you to start providing your solution to the puzzle. And after providing the solution and after the CPU has executed op win, it should be able to broadcast to the network as well. And then your bounty can be claimed. Now, a note that there are sometimes issues right now due to the insanely large size of transactions. Each CPU opcode creates a several meg or each CPU clock cycle rather creates a several megabytes transaction. And I have dealt with uh, programs as I'll get to in a second that have thousands of uh, CPU uh, clock cycles uh, to complete the uh, contract and claim the winnings. I'm certain that people are going to write programs that have millions of them. And so we're going to see, you know, millions of transactions that each are on the order of, uh, you know, uh, three or four megabytes in size. So I don't want to disrupt the uh, BSV network in its current uh, state, and therefore I, I, I have not, uh, you know, there, there may be issues with, uh, there's definitely issues on my side of the stack with the MetaNet client. Um, there's, there's definitely issues on, on, on minor side for, for this type of, of, of extremely intensive uh, network activity uh, for, for actually making this happen in a practical and, 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 you know, is the reality that we can execute this right now? Uh, maybe it will fall over. But 
Um, that's for us to figure out as a community now that we have this capability. So uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the Everett instruction set architecture. And what I want to do here is provide some examples because we want to actually execute code using this and see it run, right? And so we'll run it using the emulator. And, um, you know, after that's done, uh, you know, we can actually compose what would theoretically be a transaction to send out to the network. Uh, like I said, due to some infrastructural limitations of the current BSV network, I do not believe these transactions will uh, succeed, unfortunately, uh, at this time of recording. Perhaps by the time you try it, it might be. Um, but I don't want to make any promises there. But what we can definitely do is run these things in the uh, emulator here, and then we'll look at the script contract code to actually show how this is uh, working. So Everett Instruction Set Architecture, due to the low-level integration of smart contracting capabilities within the CPU, um, we have created a new ISA, including opcodes and an assembly language. Uh, so full documentation is going to be provided. Um, here are some simple programs that can be assembled using the CPU debugger's built-in assembler. So let's go ahead and go through these. Now we can get to, and I can pull this up in a little bit of a better uh, format as well. But um, yeah, let's look at some examples and then I'll cover some of the implications. And we'll execute a few of these examples just to show this program in operation. I'm just gonna go to the actual, um, whoops. Uh, the CPU debugger code base here on GitHub, and I'm just going to look at some of these examples. So, right, um, the first thing we're going to talk about is a uh, Fibonacci numbers counter on the stack. So we'll just walk through this assembly language program. In the assembly language, we have markers here for doing, you know, jumps and, and things like that. So it's, uh, you know, we're writing code that's going to run on Bitcoin and also use jumps for the first time ever. Uh, no one has done that type of thing before. So in the initial uh, thing, we're going to basically load the register number three with the number one. We're going to put the number one in register three. We're going to put the number one in register two. And then we're going to push the... Um, have I written a bug here? I don't think so. No, this code does appear to work. Let's go ahead and just uh, run this. But we're going to push those registers on the stack, and then in the loop, we're going to move the registers around, add things, push things, and then load the loop address into memory, and then jump to the loop address, which is going to bring us back up here. And so I won't run this, um, you know, uh, I'll increment it step by step, because otherwise we would actually end up in an infinite loop which is a real problem, whereas previously in Bitcoin, it wasn't really possible to have uh, that type of infinite loop problem. I'm just gonna paste the code here from that example into my assembler. I'm going to assemble it into the CPU's uh, bytecode here. And so we can see that. And I'll just go ahead and uh, paste the, uh, the code here. I'm gonna boot the CPU, and then I'll just increment it. So as I increment it, first we can see that R3 has now got the value one in it. And I'll just go ahead and increment another opcode. This is another, right, so if we ever actually were to successfully, so we're doing this off chain right now, but were this to ever complete, right, every one of these increments, right, you can see the number of total instructions on the top right here, uh, where it says executed instructions two. Each one of these is a, is a separate Bitcoin transaction that is multiple megabytes in size. And we'll get to why that is as I show the, uh, CPU uh, smart contracts uh, source code in just a second. But I'll go ahead and increment here. I'm actually just adding some values onto the stack. Um, I can see the execution pointer is at five, the stack pointer is at one, and I can see there's zero, one, right? And I'm just gonna continue incrementing here and it looks like we just jumped. And now I see, uh, I see two on the stack and I'll just keep doing this. And as I keep running this, you can see that we've got a Fibonacci counter in the CPU and it keeps pushing Fibonacci numbers onto the stack every six or so instructions. So that's really cool, right? And if I were to continue this, right, I've already made 104, uh, you know, uh, 104 uh, transactions here. And each of these would be, you know, a couple megabytes in size on chain as it's executing the CPU uh, smart contract. So, you know, uh, this isn't very useful in terms of actually being a smart contract because uh, you can never win. You'll just go in an infinite loop forever. But 
it's a simple initial demonstration. It's a small program that kind of is an introduction to the Bitcoin uh, CPU architecture. So um, now we have this stack that has these things on it, and that was really our first little uh, you know demo. So I'm going to reset the CPU now that I've I've you know kind of um, uh, finished that first little bit, and I'll delete these off the stack. And now we can move to a more advanced demo. Uh, we actually can do, uh, you know, uh, you can compute Fibonacci numbers and win. So this is one where it is actually um, going to let you, after you get to a certain value, um, you can you can actually win the, the bounty, right? So someone could go through the process of computing all these Fibonacci numbers. And if they did that and then broadcast the transaction, you could offer them money to perform that computation and reveal you the uh, correct answer. So, uh, and really you want to use things like verifying these computations, um, and, and, and so it's not generally necessary to make them put the entire thing on chain. You want to write a program that verifies some computation, but now the CPU allows you to write more of that type of uh, program, and more easily in higher level languages as we'll, as we'll talk about at the end. Um, so, yeah, in this one we're kind of doing something similar, but we're actually pushing, in this case, uh, register 2, we're pushing the number 233. And I happen to know that uh, 233 is a Fibonacci number. So we're checking, right, we're checking um, uh, the win address uh, of, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're loading the win address into the first register, and then we're jumping to the win address if R1, or sorry, if R2 equals um, R3. And what this does is it actually allows you to uh, compare these two and, and you'll end up jumping to the win only if you've actually computed the correct number. So what I'm going to do is just paste this new Fibonacci program into this uh, CPU and we'll go ahead and assemble it once again. So there it is and I'm just going to copy this bytecode and we'll just paste it in like so. Let's go ahead and boot the CPU, and I can increment a bunch of times, right? So a little bit more in depth here, and I'm running a lot more clock cycles because I'm doing all that comparison. I'm never reaching the end, because you can see that number 49, which I said earlier is, is off win, and right before I get to number 49, I'm jumping because, well, uh, it looks like, uh, you know, the, the comparison hasn't happened yet. So we're, we're um, running this, we're not actually using the stack in this program, we're, we're keeping values in, in the registers instead. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just actually run the program to completion, and I did that. Now you can see that we've actually executed 109 um, opcodes, and I'm just going to run it uh, once more, and it looks like I've won, and that's because eventually I got to the point where I did compute the number 233, and that was in R3, and I was comparing that with a hard-coded value in R2, and when those did equal, I eventually uh, jumped to the address 17, which was going to be this address here, and that's how I got down here, and I actually won the game by performing the computation after 109, 110 uh, clock cycles. So that's how that works, and that's the next example. Um, I also wrote some other cool examples. So I wrote an example to demonstrate uh, the concept of input and output, meaning you can actually, um, uh, you know, uh, have user input. And this is obviously, you know, the vast majority of these uh, smart contract use cases. I mean, you, you want the person who's solving the contract to be able to input data into the uh, CPU as they're, uh, you know, defining their solution. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to reset the CPU once again. It's going to say, hey, you've already won. I'll just say that's fine, and then I'm going to come down here and paste in this password checking program as another little example. I'll assemble this guy. You can see some longer strings here, and we're going to get to that in a second, but really these are for input and output, like talking to the user and actually, you know, um, putting that into the uh, alert box there. So let's go ahead and run, uh, let's boot the CPU and we'll increment it, and I don't remember what the password actually was. Let me check. Um, uh, so the password is, um, uh, I see, 
let me actually uh, uh, go back to the more readable version of this code. Right, so the password is jump if equal r1 r2 read print. Oh, it's uh, one two three four. Right, so that's my password. So um, I'll go ahead and execute this uh, code, and I'm just going to um, uh, you know load these things. And now it says password. So that was the output. And then I'm going to execute another op code, and it's going to say this. I'll say one 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 say okay I'll run the uh, next stop code and so when you actually are inputting data in S script you can pass in whatever value you want when prompted for input uh, I've just hooked that up to a simple JavaScript alert I'm just gonna run this it's gonna compare and it's going to say uh, you know uh, wrong password consider using authwrite and authwrite is a system where you actually don't need passwords anymore that I've created but I'm gonna go ahead and increment and we'll go ahead and you know I think we're going to jump back up here again and we'll try to enter the password again. And this time I'm actually going to hit the run button because I'm going to try a few. I'm going to say, okay, was it 2222? Two, 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 two. It says, oh, wrong password. And as you can see, the number of instructions, I'm, I'm at 14 instructions. And then I, you know, uh, it's going to ask for the password again. It's going to say, oh, I don't know, um, 1235. And every time I enter the wrong password, it's going to ask. So I'm going to try 1234. And now it says I've gotten to 40 instructions because I tried the password wrong a few times. But if I increment, usually it, uh, it stops right short of running up win. That way you can do the final increment. And then I win. So because I guessed the right password, um, you know, after 41 um, uh, clock cycles, I was able to uh, win the amount that, was, that would have been in that contract. Of course, any rational person who was executing that contract would have just looked at the code and figured out that they could enter one, two, three, four, and not waste all those extra clock cycles guessing the password. But you can do things like information hiding problems and other really advanced computations inside of the Bitcoin CPU, just as you can in normal uh, Bitcoin uh, script code. So I'm going to reset the CPU now that I've gone through that demo. And um, I wrote a few of them, right? So um, this is my favorite one though. So this one is called, is Bitcoin Turing complete? And to make the above code more interesting, uh, we can introduce op bill, which requires the person executing the contract to pay in order to continue. Uh, we will ask the user if Bitcoin is Turing complete. If they answer yes, the program will let them win. If they answer no, they can try again, but only after paying 4 million BSV into the contract. So let's just go ahead and copy this code into, oops, have I missed some? I think I might have, uh, yeah, I just missed that last comment there. Right, so let's just grab this and um, uh, so let's just paste this program in and have it assembled. Um, so let's just go ahead and assemble it. Here we are, and I'll copy this code. So we're going to use op bill, and I'll show that in the assembly language version of this contract. Basically, what's going on here is, right, we're first loading the number one into R3, and we're saying in R1, we're going to say, you know, is Bitcoin turn complete one or zero? You can answer one or zero. And, uh, and then we're going to print, and when you call the print opcode, it prints whatever's in R1 onto the screen. And you call read, and read is going to put whatever the user entered in their text field into R1, the register. And so I'm going to move R1 into R2. I'm going to load the success address into um, R1, and then I'm going to jump to R1 if R2 equals R3. And in the case of this, I've actually... Um, you know, I have R3 equal to 1 already, and I have R2 equal to what they entered. So we'll only jump to success after they've done that, right? Then we're going to say um, pay 1 BSV and try that again uh, into R3. Or sorry, R1, we're going to print that on the screen. I actually changed it from 1 BSV to uh, 4 million BSV into R1. And then op bill requires that when the contract continues... Um, then you actually need to increase the value of the UTXO by the amount in R1 in order to uh, continue execution. So here we can actually bill somebody for 
uh, 4 million BSV if they answer that Bitcoin is not Turing complete, then after that, they can, um, you know, jump back to the start and try again. So let's go ahead and execute this code now. Um, so op bill, because I'm running this off chain, uh, I will not uh, need to pay. Uh, were I to broadcast this and actually claim this using this code path I'm about to take, I would need to uh, pay. So let's just go ahead and make sure I have copied the right thing into the um, into the Bitcoin heap here. Let's just go ahead and delete this, and we'll go ahead and boot and run our CPU. All right, is Bitcoin Turing complete? I'm going to say no, and then it says pay one BSV and try that again. And it says, is Bitcoin Turing complete? I'm going to say no again. So I've just paid 8 million BSV. And finally, I'll say, ah, maybe I should consider that Bitcoin might be Turing complete. I'll hit one, and then I'll go ahead and press enter. And then, uh, you know, you can see that after 33 instructions, I've finally jumped down to op 49, op win. And I'll go ahead and, uh, you know, uh, claim my winnings. So I just won you know, negative 8 million um, BSV plus whatever was in the contract uh, for my my degree of competence and knowledge about whether or not Bitcoin is Turing complete, a question which I will not weigh in on and will not um, uh, speculate one way or the other. Um, all right, got a couple more demos here and then we'll kind of get to some of the implications and what this really means for the future. I built this thing called Push Pop Cat Greeter. And this is a reference to push, pop, and cat with respect to uh, stack operations. So here you can see a cat that is holding something that isn't actually, I've been told, a, a real push pop, but um, it's close enough. So this is our um, cat greeter. Um, and basically the way this works is, I'll run through the code for this. It's going to load greetings into R2. It's going to load enter your name into R1. It's going to print R1, it's then going to have the user enter a value, which is going to be stored into R1. It's then going to push R1 onto the stack. It's going to move the value of R2 into R1, now that R1 has been on the stack. It's going to pop R2 off, so it's going to pop, pop from the stack onto uh, R2, so that way now R1 is, you know, the word um, greetings, and R2 is going to be what your name was. It's going to concatenate those together and store that into R3, we're going to move R3, which is the concatenated greetings plus your name, into R1, and we're going to print that onto the screen, and then you're going to win. So that's how this code is going to work. We'll go ahead and step through this one instruction at a time, and it's a very simple greeter program, but it's a push-pop cat greeter. So let's just go ahead and delete that, and we'll go ahead and run this, and we'll go ahead and copy this. And we'll go ahead and paste it up here, just like we do. I should reset the CPU first because I had something else running. Uh, let's clear that. And now I can actually go ahead and paste this in. And let's go ahead and uh, just execute this, uh, this code here. So boot and run. It's going to say, enter your name. I'll enter Ty. And then it says, greetings, Ty. And if I reset this, I've just won, but I'll reset it. Um, and I'll go ahead and boot it again, and this time we'll step through it one at a time. So first, we are, we've just loaded this value here into R2. So you can see R2 does in fact equal that uh, value. Uh, there's some representation issues with the debugger for very, very large values, but um, we'll then go ahead and uh, load uh, into R1 that next value. So we've populated that. Now, when we do this opcode 17, that's going to say print. So it's going to print whatever's in R1. You know, it's going to encode it as a string, of course, so we can read it onto the screen. And there's that. Then we're going to go past that. It's going to go to opcode 18, which says enter. So if I enter something, you know, I'll say, um, I'll say uh, Ty again as my name. That's going to be encoded into an, a big int and then put into R1 after I enter it. So you can see that there. Um, and then I'll go ahead and increment, right? I just loaded uh, R2 into R1 after I pushed R1 onto the stack. And then I'm going to pop uh, R2. I'm going to pop from the stack into R2. So basically, it's just a way to swap R1 with R2. So, you know, first I pushed uh, R1. I then uh, loaded this value, uh, and then I, I, I got R2 um, back. 
Uh, so now, you know, they've been swapped. Um, and then we're going to, you know, use um, this, uh, this cat. It's going to combine R1 with R2 and store the value in R3. We're going to move R3 into R1, and then we're going to use the print, which is going to actually print the concatenated value back to the user. So that's our push pop cat uh, greeter, and then after that, uh, you win, right? And you can claim the UTXO. Not a very useful computation, but there's a lot of useful things that we can start to build with this Bitcoin CPU, um, you know, into the future. Uh, the CPU also supports subroutines and uh, and things like that. Uh, I'm going to reset this, and I'm going to go back here, and I'll, I'll just um, kind of go through some of these later examples. I won't go into depth about this, but we've got subroutine guessing game. So uh, this uses a subroutine uh, to actually have a function that evaluates whether the guess is too, li uh, too high, too low, or whether the guess is correct, and you win if the guess is correct. I believe the uh, value is 42 that you're trying to uh, guess. So it has you enter numbers, and then you know you can win. It's too high, too low. You got the cases here, the check, and the subroutine, and the loop. So that's how that program works. I'll just run it briefly once here without providing too much more detail, just because we're going to want to uh, wrap up here pretty quick. Um, I'm just going to copy this code once again, go to the CPU and assemble it. And then once we do this, uh, and once we get through these, we're going to actually show. So this is a longer program, right? Um, you can read the assembly if you want to understand it. I'll go ahead and boot the CPU and start incrementing this code just to demonstrate the uh, subroutine capabilities of the CPU. We're just going to say, enter your guess. I'm going to say 19. It's going to say, your guess is too low. Try again, yes or no. I'll just go ahead and say, uh, yes. Um, and then enter your guess. I'm going to say 45. It's going to say, your guess is too high. Do you want to try again? I'll just say, yes. Uh, enter your guess. I'm going to say 42. And then it's going to say, your guess was correct. And then I can increment once more. And if I do, then I win. So now I can get the UTXO. And of course, a rational person would in reality just look at the code, guess 42 the first time, and then get the money. But um, it shows the subroutine capabilities of the CPU, which we'll get to in the final thing about you know, how useful that can be. Reset the CPU. I'm going to uh, try this again. And I'll, use, I'll just demonstrate off lose once. So I'm going to boot and run the CPU. I'm going to try to make a guess of like one or something. Uh, you guys was too low. I'm going to say, do you want to try again? I'm going to say no. And then I'm going to run this and it's going to say, okay, well, if you don't want to try again, then you lose. And now the CPU is in a state where it cannot go forward. It's been halted and someone will come along after that time delay has passed, reset the state back to the initial state of the program and then claim the winnings after having just increased the bounty by the amount that uh, original solver had just uh, lost because they got the CPU to the state without actually getting a, a correct solution. Right, so that is how that works. I'm going to now go ahead and move on. So I have a recursive subroutine Fibonacci, uh, factorial uh, calculation. And so um, this is using the concept of recursion. So yes, our Bitcoin CPU can do function calls and it has calling conventions, but it can also do uh, recursion. So that is demonstrated by this uh, computer program here. And I'm just going to briefly uh, run it. Um, I believe this doesn't have a limit currently. So I just want to, I think this is an infinite loop program. Let me just review it here because I don't remember. It was pretty late when I wrote this. Oh, you can win. Um, oh, okay. So it's what are we going? Oh, yeah, it, it's interactive. I forgot. I added interactive uh, support to this program. So you can actually go ahead and enter values. So we'll just go ahead and assemble and run this program here on the Bitcoin CPU. And then after we do, I'll get to the ROM. And then that one is kind of under development. And then we'll get to the S script uh, source code, which is what I'm sure people are waiting to uh, look at. I'm going to go ahead and execute this uh, code. It's going to say, enter a number. I don't know. Let's compute 52 factorial. Is that reasonable? I think it is. All right. So it just dumped out this very large value, right, uh, in R1. And it just ran, you know, hit enter here. It just ran 883 computations 
and dumped some things out into the console here. But if I look at R1, it's, it's uh, what, 8.065 times 10 to the 67th power. So it just computed an extremely large number. And if I go and Google what is 52 factorial, uh, you know, lo and behold, it's 8.065 times 10 to the 67th power. So our CPU has demonstrated the concept of recursion by computing a factorial of a very large number in 883 um, uh, clock cycles. And uh, it did some pretty heavy computation there, and that's why it broke the uh, output, because it thought that was a string because of how large the number was. Uh, but if you look in the actual debugger, you can see the, the true value. Um, right. So that is the complete set of um, fully working programs. The final thing I was trying to build is a simple uh, ROM, as you would call it. So kind of like Wasmon, if anyone's familiar with that, on the 6502. So it's a runtime programmable computer. Uh, this example shows a user um, uh, being able to, uh, you know, you can write things into memory, you can execute using jumps, and you can read memory locations uh, in the heap. Uh, at runtime, the users can enter instructions to load them into the heap and they can jump to the start of their program, enabling them to dynamically execute arbitrary code on the CPU based on user input. So they can actually input things, they can load their own program into particular uh, memory, and of course your code can check what code they propose to execute and whether it would be you know, suitable or not. And, um, and so yeah, this is a, this is a a ROM. I'm not actually going to run this only because number one, I think we're getting short on time, and number two, it's under development and doesn't work uh, fully yet, just like um, a few uh, of the of the other things with this project. But um, what I will do is show the uh, source code here. So I have in the source directory of our repository that we've been working in, uh, I have a contracts directory, which is where the CPU contract itself is and it imports a lot of stuff from Script. It defines, uh, you know, opcodes, uh, all, uh, all of the opcodes that we're gonna use, and so you can see a listing of all of the opcodes supported by the CPU here. Uh, it supports a few different state variables for things like, uh, you know, the, uh, whether the contract is being solved, who the current solver is, um, the, the bounty uh, multiplier, and the time until the uh, the, uh, you know, uh, solution becomes stale, which is a block height, generally. Um, then we just store, you know, heap, initial heap, uh, stack, initial stack, call stack, um, all that type of thing, and go into the registers as well as the initial values for the registers. The constructor takes a few different values, um, and then we move into just ways of unlocking this, right? So to... Um, uh, right to increase the bounty anybody in the world can just increase the bounty and it copies the state of the UTXO It just allows them to increase by a particular amount uh, We start solving by you know passing in a solvers public key and a signature and uh, You know what the current block height is and it's if you think through the incentives It's actually in their interest to provide the, uh, the current uh, block height um, So there's no real exploit there. We thought through that internally um, so, right, there's a, there's a helper for each one of these methods, and then the public method, we have a uh, recover from failed solution, which just resets the state back to the initial state. Uh, one thing I didn't really talk about is checkpoint. So checkpoint is an opcode, a special opcode in the, in the assembler, but it actually is the only way to mutate the initial state uh, as stored by the CPU. So if ever you program wants to actually allow checkpointing, you know, I haven't thought through fully what the implications of that are, but uh, somebody could create a partial solution that, that meets certain criteria, and then in the future somebody could uh, kind of reset back to that checkpoint state instead of resetting back to the initial state. Then there's just all of the opcodes. So, um, you know, here's op add. It just adds R1 to R2, and that's all it does, right? So for each opcode, you pass in the current instruction. We verify that the current instruction is actually on the heap at the execution pointer where we currently are. We perform our operation, and then we increment the execution uh, pointer. And in the early days, I actually once forgot to increment the execution pointer in a particular opcode, and it was very, very um, uh, difficult to figure out what was going on. Each opcode has a subsequent helper 
which just doesn't do any of the other stuff. Uh, it was necessary for uh, running the off-chain computation, um, and then the on-chain version as well uh, can be done using the, um, the public functions. Um, right, here's subtract, multiply, divide, and there's about a few thousand lines of code in here, and they just, uh, you know, uh, do uh, all the opcodes. So, yep, I don't know, we can look at a random one. Here's op L shift. So we take R3 is equal to R1 shifted by the number of, and I just took this from the utils of S script, um, right? So now everybody can write L shift op operations in their, uh, in their programs, and etc. So, yep. Um, you know, it's, uh, I guess, only 1,700 uh, lines, but, um, you know, you've got, like, clear base pointer, uh, set base pointer, uh, you have your subroutine operations, you have all the different things that you need in a CPU um, to, to make it work properly, and, um, you know, it, uh, sometimes you have to pass in a value that is the current value from a location, for example, in the stack or heap, and we just verify and authenticate it against what the contract knows to be true uh, before we... Uh, go ahead and execute the uh, operation, such as this pop operation uh, here. So that is the actual contract itself. I have some polyfills. I have my assembler file, which essentially keeps a listing of all the opcodes, and then it's a simple, uh, you know, uh, uh, assembler that just uh, takes assembly language code and, and it translates it into uh, machine code. Um, I have the assembler React component, which is pretty simple. I then have the... Um, uh, broadcast puzzle solution function which actually goes and sends out the solution on chain and like I said um, I, I think that the Bitcoin network needs to mature a little bit before we get there uh, so here's the debugger itself this contains all the state you know the CPU uh, the, the the representations of, of the different things you can do the handlers for the various different uh, control panel buttons and then um, as we go forward here we see the uh, actual, uh, you know, uh, user interface uh, that we were looking at. Uh, final, we have uh, we have a couple things here. We have um, execute mock instruction, which just uh, will call a particular function based on the instruction being passed in, and then execute real instruction for when we want to replay something onto the chain itself. It just, you know, it's a switch statement just like the other one. Um, you can look over that if you want. And then that's really everything in this uh, in this repository. That's the whole project. So this has been the Bitcoin uh, CPU. It is exceedingly useful, um, I think, and there's a lot of implications to what people are going to build with this. No longer are we bound by the predicate uh, constraints of the Bitcoin scripting language. We can now go beyond that, right? I defined an assembly language and an instruction set architecture uh, for this uh, CPU such that people can now create compilers for languages like C and eventually even JavaScript um, and other languages uh, down to this uh, instruction set. And so someone could develop a, a GCC backend that actually allows you to finally, at long last, you know, write C code, uh, make use of existing uh, C code, and execute... Uh, you know, large numbers of instructions uh, on top of uh, Bitcoin. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of implications. I'll just read through here. So, um, the CPU uh, excels at problems where the number of iterations is not known at the time the program uh, is uh, written and the problem is kind of proposed to the set of possible solvers. Conventional predicate-based code can be used in conjunction with uh, loop unrolling when the number of uh, loop uh, iterations can be approximated, but this approach um, uh, with the CPU will ultimately enable the solver to dynamically interact with the contract. Um, so, uh, you know, future expansion into areas like uh, checkpointing and data signature verification. Um, uh, the proposer or even other parties entirely can interact with contracts dynamically while they're being worked on so that people can uh, update based on information that um, that hasn't that wasn't known at the time the original contract was proposed but which works within that framework of rules set up originally uh, for that contract and then pay people and bill people dynamically and continue to execute the UTXO 
um, even after certain people have been paid out for certain components of uh, ultimate solutions to uh, to problems. Um, so you know it's pretty useful uh, for for that reason. I would say uh, the implications of being able to execute general computation within Bitcoin, including the ability for jumps and subroutines, are uh, significant. The path is now clear for ports of existing CPU architectures as well. So you could create like a 6502 um, CPU um, as well as higher level languages that I mentioned like uh, C and even Solidity code. So there you go. You can compile Solidity code and it would execute. The wider economic implications are also significant uh, with the ability for people to propose new types of contracts. People can create simulated worlds in which the efficiency of various processes are assessed, such as the routing of uh, shipping containers across logistics networks. Uh, those that provide the best solutions given the constraints are financially rewarded. Uh, memory mapped I.O. can of course be connected to the heap as required. And keep in mind there is an unlimited number of potential uh, you know, things that can be put into the heap and places where the program can jump to. Um, so memory app IO can be connected as required by various different applications and used in conjunction with the load and store instructions um, and uh, you know uh, conceptually possible also to run even things like AI inference assessing the uh, utility uh, of results uh, on the way to particular solutions um, to kind of um, evaluate them and use that to determine puzzle solutions. Um, in closing, Bitcoin was always um, as Turing complete as any existing machine. Transactions drive the execution of programs which do not need to fit within a single script. A potentially never-ending loop can be executed for as long as a solver is willing to bear the necessary transaction fees, something they would only do if it eventually leads to the correct solution. Thank you.